Today, the Gentile revival gets rolling in Galatia. Hi, I'm David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. Well, it's so great to be together once again as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament, and you are looking great today, by the way. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 13. I'm going to back up just a little bit from where we left off last time, because uh, we're right in the middle of a sermon by the Apostle Paul there in Pisidian Antioch. And he's preaching in front of, uh, at a synagogue, mostly Jews, of course, but also God-fearing Gentiles, those who believed in the God of, of uh, Israel. And um, he's just told them about uh, the, the, the prophecies have been fulfilled, the Messiah has come. And uh, amazingly, he was uh, not recognized by the leaders, the Jewish leaders in, in, in Jerusalem. They killed him, but he came back to life and many witnessed to that fact. And boy, he has the ears of his listeners. And so he says in verse number 38 of Acts chapter 13, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Uh, take heed, therefore, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. And he quotes from the little uh, Old Testament uh, prophet book, uh, prophetic book of Habakkuk. Behold, you scoffers, Marvel and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. And so that is obviously a, a, a warning. And I just wanted to hone in on one little part of that, um, the first part, behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish. Obviously, the perishing is something that would happen as a result of God's judgment upon them for their scoffing and their marveling, but for their unbelief, which he describes in a subsequent uh, phrase here later down in that, in that verse. I've got a little number one by the word perish there in my Bible, and it says literally disappear. And isn't uh, that one of the common connotations of perishing? When someone perishes, there's you know generally not much or anything left of them. They're they're gone. Uh, we talk about perishable items. They you know they, they they don't keep lasting. They ultimately disappear in their perishing. And and that being the case, I just can't resist mentioning that uh, one more instance here of the warning that is made to unbelievers and scoffers is not a warning of eternal torture in hell. Again, pushing aside the fact that there are verses that do indicate that people are thrown into hell and people do suffer there. Uh, but here's one more of numerous, numerous cases where the, 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 the warning that's given is a warning of perishing. And as I pointed out to you several times in the past, I'm sure, doesn't it seem funny that uh, funny is the wrong word. Doesn't it seem odd that if, in fact, people are going to be tortured eternally, screaming, weeping, and gnashing their teeth in flames forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, that uh, a word choice that would be uh, made by God in warning people would be anything close to the word perish? Because even if perish actually does mean in the Greek or the Hebrew, you know, as his office said, well, it literally means, you know, not really perishing. There's no really finality to it. There's no ending to it. It just goes on and on and on. E even if that, you know, is a, uh, an actual meaning of the Greek word there, I mean, the word is best translated perish. That's how the translators do translate it. Why would God ever risk anyone misunderstanding what the ultimate consequences were if they were a million times? times worse than perishing, why would you ever use a word like perish? Okay, and so I just bring that up for, as food for thought one more time, all right? Uh, this is something we, we've covered in, in past programs, and I'm not going to belabor the point, just throwing it out uh, for your consideration one more time. God so loved the world, right? Whoever believes in him will not perish. But what does he get? The opposite of perishing, eternal life. So then we go to verse number 42. Here's the reaction of all those in the synagogue that day who heard this very informed, firm sermon. And as 
Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Well, there you have it. Praise God. You know, people who are rightly reacting to the message of the gospel, um, it's, it's really gotten their attention. Uh, they're interested, uh, so interested that the, the verb used is they're begging that they could hear more about this the next time that they come together in a week on the Sabbath. And then furthermore, in verse number 43, now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes, so those are Gentiles who have converted to Judaism, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Well, you know, Luke doesn't elaborate on all that Paul was saying to them as he urged them to continue in the grace of God, but it seems to me like, well, it's hard for me to believe that Paul would have left them hanging and saying, oh, you have to wait till next week to, to, to hear, you know, how how you could receive forgiveness of sins that I've just promised you through Jesus Christ. What are the steps that you take and and so forth? And and he's actually had already told that told them that everyone who believes is freed. And so these people believe. There's no in- indication that Paul led them in a sinner's prayer and gave them then some kind of a assurance of their salvation, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, real pe- people who really believe the gospel, man, they believe and they start acting like it immediately. And you, you don't even necessarily have to tell them to. To repent, uh, but not that it wouldn't be wise to tell them to repent because that's part of the package. But if they truly believe in Jesus Christ and realize I'm receiving forgiveness of sins by believing in him, well, of course they're repenting, okay? And so he's encouraging them to continue in the grace of God. Well, that implies they must have uh, launched off in, 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 you know, in, they have an inauguration already into the grace of God, which we know, of course, that only comes through Jesus Christ. So people are being born again, not just Jews but also God-fearing proselytes, Gentiles, were believing in Jesus, and they're all waiting, anticipating, you know, the next Sabbath, seven days, to hear Paul speak again, okay? Well, next time you and I are together, we're gonna be looking at that next time that they got together, so you don't wanna miss that, right? Right, I'll be right back. All right, we are in Acts chapter 13, verse number 44. The last time we were together, you know, Paul was in Pisidian Antioch preaching the gospel, great receptivity there amongst the the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, the proselytes in the synagogue. And at the end of the meeting, wow, a lot of interest, people following Paul and asking questions and so forth, and he's encouraging them to continue in the grace of God. So we're now jumping it forward in time one week as we come to Acts chapter 13 and verse number 44. And the next Sabbath, that's Saturday, remember, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. Now, stop a second. How did that happen? I mean, you know, did they put out advertisements on the radio? Not likely. Uh, Word spread by word of mouth from the Jews who were present the week before and from the God-fearing Gentiles. And it's much more likely that they were the spreaders of the message and, uh, you know, because all the Jews would have been in the synagogue. So now the, the, the congregation has swelled immensely. When he says the whole city, it's mostly Gentiles that are coming now who weren't there before, and who have they heard from? They probably heard from uh, the fellow Gentiles, but who were believers in the God of Israel. So there's a lot of interest in this city, and this is like a wonderful opportunity. I'm sure that Paul, when he saw the crowd, his heart just swelled with joy, saying, wow, what a harvest this is. The harvest is so ripe. Look at all these Gentiles who are hungry to believe in Jesus, and he had the message for them. And and so uh, we read in verse number 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. And so what could have been a wonderful occasion, there's this note of sadness, and and it's all based upon something extremely petty, jealousy. Uh, You know, and jealousy is so petty and so foolish, and, and this Uh, is a perfect illustration of how foolish it is. I mean, 
filled with jealousy? What are you in it for? I mean, they're in it for, wow, we're popular, we're, uh, you know, respected rabbis here, and uh, we have our own little corner on the market of truth, and we like feeling that we're superior, and so we don't want it this just sloshing around and spreading to all of those other commoners, the, the Gentiles and so forth, and, and they don't like the, you know, the notoriety that suddenly Paul has. He's been elevated in people's minds, and so, you know, just petty, petty stuff, and what a shame. And so they're speaking against Paul, trying to undo what he's doing, and, and blaspheming. I'm assuming they weren't blaspheming against the God of Israel, but they're blaspheming against Jesus, who, you know, he might as well blaspheme against the God of Israel. And, and, and so in verse number 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, quote, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. I mean, well, I'm sure a little note of sarcasm in his voice at that point in time. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For thus the Lord has commanded us, and now he quotes from the Old Testament, I've placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you should bring salvation to the end of the earth. And so there it is contained right in the word of God that God is, uh, you know, wanting to reach Gentiles and uh, he wants to save Gentiles. And this is not, uh, God is not just exclusively focused on Jewish people. God so loved the world. All right? And so it's the Jews who are repudiating him. I'm assuming then that the God-fearing Gentiles were not so represented in that group. And then the many uh, Gentiles who were not amongst the quote-unquote God-fearing proselytes of, among the Jews, the, you know, they're not among that group. And so we're seeing a, a negative Jewish response in general, uh, but not in totality, of course, and a positive Gentile response, again, not in totality, but in, in, in general. And uh, do take note that the one thing that Paul brought up uh, to those Jews who were blaspheming and rejecting the gospel was they were judging themselves unworthy of, and let's say it together, now, eternal life. That's what you get, praise God, when you believe in Jesus. That's the biggie. You get your sins forgiven and you get eternal life. And Jesus defined eternal life in John on, on several uh, verses as living forever. I'm so glad these days I can read that phrase eternal life and just believe it means what it says rather than forcing a theological meaning on it that's really not there. You know, before, uh, you know, I always believed eternal life was eternal life in heaven as opposed to eternal life in hell, you know, but no, you just get eternal life. Eternal life is not something that's intrinsic within human souls or spirits, not something inherent. It's a gift from God as a result of the death of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. God grants to believing people who repent of their sins the gift of eternal life. And you get to live forever if you believe in Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't get eternal life. Okay? You perish. That's what Jesus said. Nobody can argue against that. Okay? You say, well, wait, there's other verses. Yeah, I know there's other verses, and we've discussed those in the past times. I'm just reiterating what we said in the past. Well, Here's the good reaction by the Gentiles, verse number 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. They're happy. You know, their, their hearts are receptive. We can have our sins forgiven. We can believe in this God who uh, has appointed a miraculous, a miracle worker, his son, uh, to, to, who he's appointed to be the ultimate judge of everybody and proven it to all people by raising him from the dead in front of you know hundreds of witnesses. We can believe in him. We can have our sins forgiven and we can have the promise of eternal life. This is how all people ought to react to the gospel. It's just so rare, but this is how all people ought to react. And uh, Luke comments on this and he says in the second half of verse number 48, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And so clearly, uh, there was uh, an appointing to eternal life to uh, at least some of those Gentiles. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that God pre-selected some Gentiles to believe and, of course, by default, then pre-selected other Gentiles not to believe? And it's all just on the basis of God's sovereign decree that some Gentiles responded in Pisidian Antioch and others did not? Well, that's a great question, one we're going to answer the next time we're together. I'll be right back. All right.
right, welcome back to Acts chapter 13 and verse number 48. We left off last time looking uh, at a phrase at the end of verse 48 that Luke penned about the Gentiles who uh, responded to the good news of the gospel in Pisidian Antioch uh, as Paul was preaching. And that phrase was, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And so it seems that the the cause of their believing was solely the fact that they had been appointed to eternal life. And uh, some will be quick to grab that scripture and say, see, that's what I've been telling you. God's predestined some to be saved. And then, of course, by default, those whom he is not predestined to be saved, he has, in fact, predestined to be damned. And so we've got God creating people just to damn them. Uh, they have no chance uh, of salvation. They never had any chance because God didn't predestine them. And this is passed off as, um, as a... Uh, kind of a glorification of the grace of God because, again, it leaves nothing at all to human responsibility uh, or choice. Um, You know, it's not a matter of people responding to the gospel by their heart being touched and them deciding to repent under the influence of the Spirit of God. It's simply a matter of God decrees in eternity past, who will be saved and who will not be saved. Now, if this were the only verse in the Bible, I I might buy into that, but we've got to harmonize it with 31,000 other verses in the Bible. And that interpretation, although it can be buttressed a little bit by a few scriptures here and there, removed out of their context as well, it doesn't fit into the overall tenor of scripture by any stretch of the imagination. And when people exalt single verses like this, couple them uh, skillfully with a few others and create a doctrine at the expense of 31,000 other verses, they're making a, a big mistake, okay? And you don't want to make that mistake. And, and, and again, this doesn't have to mean what they say it has to mean. Um, you know, we all believe who believe the Bible in predestination. It's clear that God foreknows everyone who will ultimately believe in Jesus Christ. And uh, he has uh, predestined them to be conformed to Jesus. That's contained in Scripture. But it's ba- his predestining them is based upon his foreknowledge of the choices that they will make to repent under the influence of all the influences that God influences everybody with as he endeavors to win people over whom he loves and for whom Jesus died, okay? And so this could be interpreted that, you know, those who were appointed to eternal life were simply appointed to eternal life because God foreknew that they would believe in Jesus, and so the benefit they get is being appointed to eternal life. This verse does not rule out the fact that the possibility of the fact that it's not a sovereign decree but it's a predestining based upon a foreknowledge i'd also submit to you and this is maybe a little bit uh um, you know less likely but yet i think it is a possibility when luke writes as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed if he had said for example or wrote for example as many as jesus died for believed, well, we'd go, whoa, that's obvious what that means. We wouldn't say, well, only some believed uh, because Jesus only died for some, right? We never say that because Jesus is the propitiation not for our sins alone, but for the sins of the entire world. John says in the first verse of his uh, uh, second chapter of his first epistle, we would say, wow, everybody there believed. As many as for whom Jesus died believed. Well, they all believed. And so Paul, uh, uh, Luke's just writing it kind of in a, you know, fancy way. And so is it possible that in one sense God has appointed everyone to eternal life? Because we know that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth, right? God wants all to repent and to receive his gift. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. And so in that sense, they indeed have all been appointed to eternal life. And the, 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 the general gist of this passage does show us a contrast between the, the, the rejection of the, the Jews, by and large, and the incredible receptivity of the Gentiles. And so maybe, just maybe, Luke is saying that every Gentile present believed. You might say, well, that's impossible. Well, why is that impossible? Well, why is that impossible? It's not impossible at all. It's 
it, you know, might seem statistically strange, but it's very possible. We, we, we've seen so much receptivity, Gentiles begging to hear more about this, the whole Gentile city so interested coming out to hear this. Obviously, they knew uh, some to some degree what they were going to hear from Paul, right? I mean, they'd already made a decision if they were going to be rejecting it because they had a week to think about what they heard from the last Sabbath when either they were present when Paul preached or they heard the gist of what Paul preached to the Gentiles who were present. See, so when they came that day, I mean, they had a pretty good idea what, you know, he was going to say. And it's very possible that many of them already had become believers by the testimony of the others who, who had shared with them and were, all, you know, already wholeheartedly committed to Jesus Christ. I don't know, okay? But either one of those possibilities is a real possibility. And to take this one verse and say, well, there it is, the sum of all biblical truth, you know, and I'll throw in a few other verses there that I can steal out of context from other places and, you know, yeah. please don't do that on this broadcast, okay? All right. So here's a good verse in verse number 49. The word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. Wow, it's going. And not because of necessarily Paul's ministry and Barnabas's ministry, but because of, you know, people hearing it, they're naturally sharing it. This is an amazing message. Verse number 50, but the Jews aroused the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. And I want you to remember this because remember, we're reading through the New Testament chronologically and we're only going to read really one more chapter after chapter uh, 14 in Acts. Then we're going to go to the next book that was penned uh, chronologically in the New Testament. It would have been the book of Galatians. Galatians is a book that, you know, Paul's in Galatia right now preaching the gospel and he's having trouble with the Jews. Don't forget that. That's going to make all the difference in understanding the foundation in Galatians. All right, out of time. See you next time. God bless you. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the behind-the-scenes videos. Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant and learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.